Hi, everybody. This is Gatsad. Today, I have another wonderful guest. I wish we weren't talking under these current circumstances. I, I wish that we were talking about academic stuff. I have Professor Shai Davidai, who is a assistant professor at uh, Columbia University's Business School. Uh, we have a lot in common in terms of academic background in that we both hail with our PhDs from Cornell. And actually, uh, Shai's doctoral supervisor, Tom Gilovich is actually one of my professors at Cornell. So Shai, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, God. And, and you know, it's it's interesting because there's, there's always this immediate kinship when you hear someone who crossed paths with Tom Gilovich. For me, it's like, you know, it's a lineage kind of thing. Oh, Tom is unbelievable. You know, and actually in my, I guess you can't see it here, but in this book right here, my latest book on happiness, uh, I have a whole chapter on uh, the psychology of regret. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you probably know, or maybe some of our, our viewers don't, so let me just mention it. Tom was instrumental in studying the two sources of regret that loom over our heads. The regrets due to action, regrets due to inaction. And it turns out that over the long view, long-term view, the things that we didn't do, the inactions are usually the the regrets that haunt us the most. So Yes, Tom is a fantastic guy. Do you ever yeah. get a chance to go back to Cornell? Um, I try to go twice a year. Uh, so Tom, um, our, our relationship has evolved from mentor-mentee to colleagues to just friends. Uh, you know, we're a generation apart, but uh, we just enjoy each other's company. Uh, we did end up actually doing some research on regret ourselves, following up on his uh, work in the 90s. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've always loved about Tom's way of looking into research and, and looking into life is that they are really, you know, indistinguishable, right? He studies real life things, and then you can take the things that he studies and apply them to real life. And for me, you know, the, the research on regrets of inaction, failures to act, and how that ends up haunting you for the rest of your life is in many ways informed a lot of the decisions in the past four months that yeah. uh, you know i i know what i'm more or less likely to regret i'll re i'll more likely i'll be more likely to regret not speaking up than speaking up and bearing the con the costs even though it may be in the short run you know things are different but in the long run i know that the research has my back what a what a i mean beautiful way to set up what we're going to be talking about you're exactly right um so I guess I first heard of you uh, when you put up this very sort of impassioned uh, clip, maybe seven, eight minutes long, where you're standing in the public square, I think on the Columbia University campus, and you're sort of talking about some of the difficulties that you're seeing on campus post October 7th. Maybe we could start there and then drill down. Yeah, so I mean, there's many different ways to tell the story depending on where it starts. Um, but I think the most um, parsimonious way, right, would be to start with October 9th or October 8th, when uh, a couple student organizations here uh, wrote up here at Columbia, wrote a letter that basically uh, not just justifies or excuses October 7th massacre in Israel, by Hamas, but actually uh, glorifies it, you know, calling this an historic day and, and, you know, things that we have been in the past four months have become desensitized to, but are really shouldn't be desensitized to because these are horrific views, basically calling the targeting of civilians a success story. And then they, these organizations had a, a protest on campus, which was a very jarring moment for me, both as a, an Israeli and as a Jew, seeing the, the amount of hatred and vitriol that was expressed and the amount of support that was being uh, chanted uh, for Hamas, but also as an academic, seeing that this is happening at the my university, at any university, right? This kind of rhetoric that you would not expect in any other um in any other context with any other group. Um, so a week later, some of my students at Columbia Business School uh, organized an anti-terror vigil, basically standing there in support 
of the targets, the victims. Uh, saying nothing about, you know, you, it's it, not saying anything about whether there should be a war, shouldn't be a war. It's all about just like terrorism is bad. Like that's not an, it's not a hot take. It's not an, a position where you can take a for or against, I thought. Um, and, you know, people were standing there lighting can, holding candles, uh, posters of the kidnapped. Some people were talking about their own experience, a woman who's been... Um, in the forefront of volunteering with the families of the kidnapped, the hostages, uh, talked about her experiences, a student who was physically attacked while posting posters of the kidnapped uh, was told about his experience. And then I kind of had to get some stuff off my chest. And so that was, that, and... that clip was your first foray into publicly addressing the issue? Well, I was, before that, I I, I was uh, discussing it more and more on social media. I had very limited social media presence. Um, you know, before October seventh, I had my my social media followers were in the hundreds, and it was only academics talking about our research. Uh, now it's in the tens of thousands um, because of that. So it was one of my first forays into speaking up and speaking out against what I see as um, as a real moral bankruptcy. And I mean, your position, and you'll you'll fill in the details, is really, I mean, you're about as soft-spoken about this very contentious issue as a person can be, right? You, you, you're not coming at this with fire and brimstone. You're like, hey, Palestinians have the right to a dignified life. Jews have a right to a dignified life. Let's find peace. Let's agree that rape and terrorism is bad. I mean, it, it really is about as gentle an approach in sort of speaking out against the October 7th situation, correct? Well, you know, I would like to believe it. it is. Of course, we can always and should always strive to be more gentler, right? You know, that's something that I think is an important thing. We should all try to humanize both sides and always strive to see, do I have my own, you know, blind spots and my, my own biases, you know, also as someone who studies these, I'm aware of this kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's my position. And it's my position out of pure authenticity. Like I've, I've always been a lefty, you know, if I've ever gotten in any arguments throughout my life, political arguments, it was because I was too left for people. I was too, some people would call me naive for supporting and still supporting a two-state solution, uh, for speaking out against the occupation. Uh, of, and when I say occupation, I mean the 1967 armistice uh, line, not the what people are saying now, that everything is an occupation, which of course is not. But, um, you know, I just, I really was just speaking out for myself. And this is another thing uh, that's important to note. Like, I never say, I've never argued that this, my view is the right view. My, you know, I've always argued that this is a view. I am just a guy. I'm not speaking as in terms of an organization. I have never said anything about the war in Gaza, good or bad. I have never, you know, I've always empathized with civil, loss of civilian lives on both sides because it's, both sides are suffering. Um, but that doesn't mean that I won't have a strong stance against terrorism, support for terrorism, and calls for the abolition of an entire state. And how, ha so let's, so there are three different groups at your university that we could talk about in terms of how they reacted to your public engagement. And then we could talk about the, the, the more general public. You said that your social media platform has grown uh, quite a bit over the past few months. So we've got students at Columbia, We've got your colleagues at Columbia, and we've got administration at Columbia. What has been the response of each of these three groups uh, to your positions? Um, I know that those are the, the the natural fault lines for an academic to think about, but I actually don't think that those are the ones that I can make generalizations about. I actually think that there is there are three different fault lines. There are the supporters, Jewish and non-Jewish students, faculty, and staff who have been amazingly supportive, 
Um, a lot of people are doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Um, a lot of people are um, documenting things, writing letters, getting in touch with donors, right? So people think that I'm, I know I am speaking for myself, but people think that I'm the, the lone voice. And it's like, I'm not the lone voice. There's actually hundreds and maybe thousands behind me just at Columbia. Um, then on the other side, you have the, I, I don't have a word that's better to describe it other than the terror sympathizers, right? And when I if say- If you want to make it softer, you could just say detractors maybe? But it's not just detractors because, and this is both students, faculty, and staff. And, um, you know, we had a faculty letter here, including some people from the business school who signed the letter calling the October 7th massacre a military action, right? We have had um, student organizations having quote unquote teach ins about how rape is, you know, a way of resistance. Right. So, you know, for me, that's more than just the detractors, right? There's something deeply uh, disturbing in that group. Um, and it's a small group. It's a small and very vocal, very powerful group, but small. Um, and then you have the middle, the, the, the vast majority who are just silent. Many students, I don't blame the students. They are here to study. They are here to get an education, not to get into you know, shouting matches, um, but many, fa most faculty as well that have not spoken up. And at first they, they never publicly spoke up about October 7, which was a problem. Then they never spoke up against the fact that there are people that support October 7 here on campus. Again, was disturbing for me. But the third, maybe more personal insult is that when they saw the personal attacks on me, they never spoke up. Even if they disagree with what I'm doing or agree with what I'm doing, but disagree with the style, which is fine. You don't have to agree. Um, the fact that no one spoke up and is still not speaking up about you know, the silencing campaign of a fellow academic, um, that no one spoke up about the, the hatred and the anti-Semitism that I've been a target of, and they're CC'd on the emails. Almost all of my colleagues, step out my door, I see all of them. They're CC'd on the emails. I've been hurled the worst insults a Jew can be hurled at, and no one spoke up. You know, that's that's the scary thing for me as, as someone who's devoted the last 13 years to studying social psychology and, and how people behave in, in groups. Yeah, you know, uh, of course, I fully empathize with what you're going through. And uh... This is something that I've been uh, experiencing for several decades as probably the most vociferous uh, voice in academia speaking, not just about, I mean, frankly, uh, you know, speaking for uh, a pro-Jewish state or against some theological positions in the Middle East is, is hardly the only thing that I talk about. For example, all of the woke stuff as you may know or not, in, in, in this book, The Parasitic Mind, is all about where do these woke parasitic ideas come from, and regrettably, they all come from the university ecosystem. So I've been uh, someone who's been at the, if I can say, at the forefront of all that kind of hate. And actually, I'll talk about something that just happened this past weekend, which, and then I could have easily cowered and said, let me not speak to Shai, because it's only going to add uh, fire, uh, fuel to the fire, so over the past weekend, I found out because some people sent it to me that uh, there are several websites that posted a clip definitively, quote, proving that I am a Mossad agent. The story comes in from uh, a, a, something that I discuss in the happiness book in the chapter on the importance of play to happiness. And this is this is something that happened in 1982. I'm 18 years old where I discuss how there were some Israeli security people who came to to ask me to do certain things. Uh, and I actually just posted today the excerpts from my book that, that are exactly speak to that story. That was taken as proof that I'm a Mossad agent. Now, what that does, of course, is it puts a huge target on you. Not, not only are you an outspoken guy who is Jewish, not only are you an outspoken guy who is Jewish, who's got family in Israel, 
not only are you a Jewish guy who's got family in Israel, but I am the Mossad agent who is orchestrating the entire puppeteering of the universe. So the amount of threats I got and so on is just bewildering. And the, the host who had started the clip has written to me and he's now put out a statement. He said, I'm, I feel like such an idiot that I set up the clip where he, he jokingly said, so, you know, professor, I didn't, you know, I didn't know you were a Mossad agent. And then I answered, I played along. They took that. And now on endless number of websites, mm -hmm. the, the Zionist comes out as a fake Canadian, fake Lebanese, he's a Mossad agent and so on. Now I could have easily said, well, what would be a, a, a very good thing to do today is not to speak to Shai because, you know, if anything, this is going to confirm that the two Mossad agents are speaking to each other. But then if we do that, if I keep quiet and you keep quiet and everybody keeps quiet, then slowly we, we are led to the abyss of infinite lunacy. So if nothing else, this long-winded story is to tell you, I feel your pain, welcome to the infinite abyss <laughs> of darkness. But but I'll tell you, I mean, <laughs> first of all, thank you. I... I it's it's weird that you'd say that because in the past four months, I have been also been blamed for being a Mossad agent, which is so funny because, first of all, I am such a wuss I would never be able to pass <laughs> the Mossad test. That's second, exactly like, what a Mossad agent would would exactly. say. Shy. But the second the second thing is you know the Mossad like if I was a Mossad agent, why would I want why would I have such a big audience? I'd be, but 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 for putting that aside, so I've been blamed as a Mossad, and my dad has been blamed as a Mossad. They're also going, and it's the irony is this is not new. They did this to Dreyfus before there was a state of Israel. The the Jew as the, you know the 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 double loyalty Jew. Every time that someone writes about me, you know I don't hide the fact that I'm Israeli. I'm Israeli. I'm and I'm not a U.S. citizen. I'm I'm a green card holder. Every time someone writes about me. They make a point of noting an Israeli foreigner in the U.S., right? Like they, they want to make that point, not realizing you're falling into the oldest anti-Semitic tropes that they, the, the Jews as this treason, double loyalty uh, people, I, I just see it as part of the problem. Um, but you mentioned something about like speaking up and speaking up against the quote unquote, like the culture in universities. And, you know, again, the irony is that I have always been the perfect Jew or the perfect Israeli, right? I am the left-leaning Israeli who opposes Netanyahu's government. I took a I took a punch to the face from a from an Israeli cop in a protest against Netanyahu's government. I uh, am, you know, completely in line with people in almost all liberal people in almost all things uh, from, uh, you know, LGBTQ issues, racial issues, immigration, like I am the perfect Israeli. But for them, the fact that I'm Israeli, but is a non-apologetic Israeli is already means that I, I can't be perfect. Right. So but that's my fault. Has that I mean. I mean, surely it, it's it surprised you in that, you know, in a sense, until you enter that arena, you're never prepared for all the tsunami of nonsense that's going to be thrown at you. But were you aware of these realities previously in academia, in the general? Because the re let me give you the, the, the reason why I'm asking this, because one of the things that has frustrated me, and this is not at all levied at you, but you now have an awakening of many people, including, for example, many powerful uh, Jewish philanthropists who suddenly have awakened to realities that some of us have been warning about for decades. And it's only that they've awakened because it has now personally come to their backyard, right? So it is my alma mater that is now affected with this lunacy. And mm -hmm. I am a donor. Therefore, I'm awakened out of my otherwise apathetic stupor. Now, I say that not to be sort of vengeful against those folks, because it's better that they wake up late rather than never. But, you know, were you already, even before you did that infamous or famous you know, passionate plea, were you already seeing some of the writing on the wall or was that the thing that kind of catapulted you into reality? Um, I, I wish I could give you an, a simple answer. The answer is both. And and it, it's important to note, like I agree with the language you're using of awakening, 
right? But that's also the language of the woke, right? Woke comes from like, we woke. And I used, I, I don't like the, the label woke, but I used to consider myself as someone who has awakened to other people's pain. Right, that, that was the idea, original idea of woke. Like I am now, my eyes are open, I see other people's pain. What I did not realize is that this so-called woke crowd, their eyes are closed to, they're, they're open to everyone's pain except one group. Yeah. Right. So, very, so like I actually feel now, and I know it might make people feel bad about me saying that, I feel more woke than, than ever before because I can see everyone's pains, including Palestinians, and including Israelis and Jews. And this, this crowd, this mob, it's not really a crowd, it's a mob. They're, they're closing their eyes to one group's pain, so they're not really woke. But, but to answer your question, like, no, I did not see it coming. But I think it's partially because I did not, we did not want to see it coming, right? We did not want to see it coming. We, we, when Kanye West went on a diatribe against Jews, no one spoke up in academia. Literally, no one spoke up, and we kind of brushed it away. When uh, in Charlottesville they were shouting, "Jews will not replace us," none of my colleagues, no one spoke up, and we kind of like brushed it under the rug. Pittsburgh shooting, there was very little, if anything. Uh, when Dave Chappelle went on Saturday Night Live on an anti-Semitic rant for fifteen minutes. Um, that was the that was the first breaking point for me, and I went online. And this I've never written anything about anti-Semitism before; it was all academic. And I went online and I said, like, that it's disturbing to me that none of my the people that I hear speaking about any other kind of racism and prejudice aren't saying anything. They're actually calling him a genius. This was November two thousand twenty-two, and no one, and it that that message kind of like died in the ether. Nobody said anything. And then when October 7th and the aftermath arrived, the the these seemingly isolated incidents that I was used to see in my life now connected. And, and now I can see like I should have known. But I didn't I saw all the dots. I just didn't want to connect the dots. But when you connect the dot, it's it, it draws a very clear picture. And the picture is of anti-Semitism. Or at least with a blasé attitude towards anti-Semitism. I don't think most of, most of my colleagues are not anti-Semitic, but it's not in their top priority to stop anti-Semitism as it is to stop other types of prejudice. So of, the next question is probably, I mean, it, it's multifactorial, so there are probably you know many different angles that you could tackle. But what do you think explains the fact that when someone is so committed to fighting injustice for N minus one groups, they can't somehow extend it to the nth group called Jews. Is it because Jews are inherently, or certainly the, the stereotype of the Jew that most people see is someone who is very successful, very powerful, and therefore I can't ever put a schema of the Jew being the victim because in all of my interactions with Jews, I mean, I remember the first time that I went to Israel when I was 18, the summer, uh, the first summer that I went to Israel, one of the reactions I had when I would enter the bus is, oh my God, the, the bus driver is Jewish. And mm -hmm. the guy who's picking up the garbage, garbage is Jewish. And I thought, because I'm only used to seeing that the Jews are not to use anti-Semitic uh, right. stereotypes. Well, they're, they're bankers and they're physicians and they're professors and they're uh, mu music orchestrators. They're, they're not garbage. So could that be, could it be as simple as that? It, it well nothing is as simple as that right but like you're right i mean the model minority jews have been a model minority in at least in the north american and western europe um context for years um and partially because jews convince themselves that if we are if we will be just a model minority they'll accept us and leave us alone right so ironically because we did everything right we're being punished for it. But I think the other thing is that Jews, the Jewish people are a very certain type of group that cannot be easily categorized in the binaries that have completely infiltrated every academic speak. Yes. Right? We're not just a religion because 
I'm an atheist and I, I believe you are as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I celebrate some of the holidays, you know, for tradition, but I don't believe in God. Um, we, we're not just an ethnicity because my ancestors came from Eastern Europe and I read that you're from, uh, from Lebanon. Yes, originally. Arabic so, speaking, but apparently Arabic. I'm a fake Arabic guy. So, you know, so you're, so it's not just an ethnicity. Um, it's also a group you can join, you can convert to. Um, so we call ourselves the Jewish people, not the Jewish race, not the Jewish religion, the Jewish people. And therefore people can't really peg us. They, you know, they say, I care about all ethnicities, but Jews are not an ethnicity. I care about all religions, but Jews, maybe Judaism is, but Jews are not. So it gives them a carte blanche to just not care. Um, this is why we don't fall under the auspices of DEI. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, I, I, find, I, I think that DEI initiatives um, at their core are important initiatives, right? Diversity is important. Equity is inc important. Inclusion is important. Maybe taken to the extreme, it leads to some you know, backfiring policies, but the core ideas are important and valuable. But the fact that the inclusion of Jews in academia is not a priority, it's not even under the auspices of DEI, the felt inclusion, then that shows me that society is built up in a way that doesn't really require the inclusion of Jews as an equal ethnic minority yeah, no, or I'm... religious minority or whatever kind of minority. No, I, I I like that answer. Of the so, I've recently been giving several talks on you know the increase in global Jew hatred and so on, and so I break up the sources of hate into different categories. Sometimes they can overlap, but there's sort of three distinct groups. There is, of course, sort of the the progressive leftist academic type, who typically will drive their Jew hatred as relating to you know the geopolitics of the Middle East the Jew as the oppressor, the Palestinians as the, the noble victims and so on. So there's that dynamic. So that's one group. There is the Jews won't replace us kind of, you know, neo-Nazi types. And then there, there, there is the third type, which is the Islamic based Jew hatred. Uh, now, one of the things that surprised me after October 7th is the extent to which in whichever direction I turned, I was getting it from all angles. Whereas at first, you know, in previous years, there might be some incident that causes neo-Nazis to focus on me obsessively for a month and then go away. Or another time, there might be another group. But here, it was sort of an orgiastic fest. In your case, are you able, not that we want to create a competition of who hates us the most, but is there a unique group or is there a unique dynamic where you say, you know, it's largely coming from the progressive academics or what's your thought on that? Oh, wow. Um, you're basically asking me to analyze who are all the people that are hating me now. Uh, in the last four months, you know, the weird thing is that, so first of all, I should say in the last four months, I've been getting more love and support from strangers than I ever had in my life. And I'm so grateful for that. I couldn't do this without people reaching out. Although to me, it's it's always a bit kind of humbling because I feel like at least get to know me first before you love me. Um, but I think the same, but the, the same thing happens. So I've been getting the last four months the, the most immense hatred and vitriol um, for from random strangers. And I'm talking thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. And I say like, at least get to know me before you hate me. You might find something that you actually merits hatred, but get to know me first. Um, I've realized that I've become a, a, a tabula rasa for haters, right? They can project whatever they want at me. And that's what I've been experiencing. So I've mostly been experiencing it from what I call the illiberal left, right? These people in the, you know, poison Ivy League schools in the inhumanities, um, you know, these like I, I I've created labels for them because I don't know how to think about them, but um, they project onto me this white supremacist racist idea, which is completely. Not like you know they they say that I'm a genocidal baby murderer like just the most horrific stuff. I have also been getting uh, a bits from the extreme right who are projecting the opposite, 
right? This is this. These are the globalists that are trying to change the order, and like the non-whites are trying to bring uh, to bring the whites down. So like, you know, David Badil talks about Schrodinger's Jew, the Jew that is both white and non-white at the same time, and and I've been experiencing that. Um, so both are happening at the same time. Um, it's way, way stronger given the current context uh, and given what I've been speaking up against uh, from the illiberal left. Wow. Um, By the know, way, I know David Badil. I just had him on my show oh, recently. Yeah, so go ahead. It, it's, it's, but this is, this is for me, this is part of why I did not want to see or was unable to see. Like in the past four months, I've read David Badil's, both of his books, yeah. Jews don't count is is incredible in in not just explaining what's happening but foreseeing what's happening. I've read Barry Weiss's How to Fight Anti-Semitism, which I think should be required reading, just like people were saying that the New Jim Crow should be a required reading. And I agree, like both things should be required reading. Even if you disagree with the points made, you should be required to engage with the questions. Um, I've been reading, uh, I read, uh, people love that Jews, like just try to understand what's going on. And and these many of these authors, they, they split the anti-Semites into exactly these three buckets, yeah. the illiberal left, the alt extreme right, and then this um, fundamentalist religious view that comes from mostly from, from Islam, but not necessarily just from Islam, but but, but again, it's a very fundamentalist and religious because it's clear that I would say 95%, 90%, I don't know, like a very, very high percentage of Muslims have no problem with Jews, right? They're just peaceful people. It's clear, just like the high, most Jews don't have a problem with anyone else and most Christians don't have a problem with anyone else. But it's, it's the extremists that are leading the fight now. Yeah. And that's that's the concern. And I think, I mean, when you have extremists of a very large number, then that number, even though it's very small, becomes a problem, right? So if you've got 2 billion people, of which only 10% have bad views, we can contest whether that's true, because there are Pew surveys and other surveys that have looked at, uh, you know, really quite vile anti-Semitism stemming from those cultures, and they hover, it may... Uh, cause you some disconcertment to know that it it's about 95 to 99%. So we can contest whether it's in the minority. Although, of course, I too, and certainly by virtue of being Lebanese, have tons of Arabic-speaking friends and supporters and fans. Uh, uh, no, but, but God, I think I think it's important to note that I, I really, it's hard for me to believe that it's even close to the numbers you're saying, but, but it, to me, it doesn't matter. Even if there's one person who doesn't believe something in a group, we shouldn't judge the entire group. Of course. Right? That's why that's why I have been vocally like speaking against not just what Hamas is doing, but the rise in Islamophobia. Yeah. Islamophobia is as abhorrent as anti-Semitism. It just there's I don't differentiate between the two. At the same time, just as I can say there are extremist Jews. Yep. Right wingers that are just extremist Jews that I completely denounce. There are extremist Christians and there are extremist Muslims, but yep. most people are not. I, I strongly believe, and maybe I want to believe, but but I, you know, I think, you know, innocent until proven guilty is an extremely important idea in my mind. Oh yes, I just wrote an article on deontological principles, which is absolute statements of morality, and 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 one of the things that I talk about is that you should never violate deontological ethics using a consequentialist ethos, right? So you don't say, I believe in presumption of innocence, but not for Brett Kavanaugh. I believe in freedom of speech, but not for Donald Trump. I believe in journalistic integrity, but not when it comes to suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story because it was too important to suppress it because we don't want Donald Trump. So I, I'm, I'm completely sold on the idea that there are foundational values that we should never violate. Right. And Are the you... same goes for both sides, right? Because mm, exactly. like you gave examples of the illiberal left, um, but which is happens a lot, but also from the the extreme right, they, they they engage in the same things. And and really it's about if we have a deontological rule, we should follow it. Now, of course, some people would say that I am trying to silence free speech, right? So um 
But again, like I think the important thing is you can have a deontological rule, like I believe in free speech and still say, yet I believe in the boundaries of free speech. But if you set those boundaries on a case by case um, situation, that's a problem. Sure. Right. But but if we if we set it up for everyone, then I think we should. Th that's that's something that makes society stronger. Do you, so earlier you were mentioning that when someone writes to you and they say, you know, I, I love you, I, I I admire you, and you say, well, get to know me first. Or and similarly, the other side of the coin when they hate you. Let me talk about the negative one. One of the things that causes me great angst, and I get dismayed by it, is not so much when someone writes to me a specific hateful thing, but in a sense, it's more pure my angst, which is I despise that there is a world where someone can exhibit such diabolical hatred for me, where if in reality they got to know me, they actually, I'm willing to bet that I can get them to actually like me, but that somehow they are unreachable, right? So that, you know, if I had all the time in the world, I would love to sit down with every single person who sends me really just remarkably hateful stuff. Like I've, I've never invoked this kind of hatred to another human being. And I've had a very rough childhood growing up in the Middle East. And, and I've look, our house was taken by Palestinians. I hold no ill will to general Palestinians. My parents were kidnapped by Fatah. I don't hold ill will to general Palestinians. And yet people can ascribe the worst traits to me. And that actually leaves me quite sad and at, at times heartbroken. Do you feel the same way or do you think that there is some magical future utopia, unicornia where kumbaya, we can get rid of this? Or is this part of the architecture of the human spirit? Look, <laughs> um, I, I'll start by saying that my entire world view about human nature has been shaken since October 7th. <laughs> I right? would think I'll, so. I'll, I'll start by saying that. And first, just like seeing the things that happened on October 7th and then seeing the reactions here and around the world. Um, but we also, like, you know, I was, I was enthralled with social psychology as an academic field, exactly because while it was, you know, it started in 1897 with social facilitation work uh, with, with, people riding bicycles and pulling ropes, um, it really got a boost after World War II, where there were two main questions being asked. You know, why do people, how do people do really evil stuff? You know, that's the Milgram experiments, exactly. famously. And the second was, why do good people stay silent in the face of evil? And that's the Solomon Ash work. And I think that even while I have studied this, I have taught this, I have still really underestimated the power of the situation. The situation and social norms are just stronger than any individual will. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, the hatred that people are ex exhibiting now towards me personally, towards, and forget me, like who am I? I'm like someone who spoke up. They're ex exhibiting towards the victims. And by the way, we should be intellectually humble here. Some people are exhibiting it towards the victims in Gaza. Like the fact that people are, are experiencing, uh, exhibiting such hatred, to me just shows that the conformity and social norms are stronger than, you know, you really need strong character. That being said, we should not accept it. And unlike in the 1930s in Germany, now we have a record, we have a public record. And when this public hysteria, this anti-Semitism ebbs and flows, when it, when it calms down, we will remember, we will remember all the people who openly, you know, called for violence against Jews, uh, who personally attacked, attacked Jews and Israelis just for speaking up like myself. Um, and I think, one way to, to deal with this and make the world better. And, and, you know, and I have to be optimistic just because I don't have any other option, right? Uh, but one way to deal with this is create stronger 
situations, right? You know, we can't rely on people to be good people. We can't rely on people to uphold norms. We need to create institutions that, you know, have clear boundaries. Because if we don't, then we'll just see this again and again. And this time it's the Jews, but it's not. We're not always going to go for the Jews, right? Well, there's there's an expression, by the way, you probably, you may know it, given that you you hail from Israel, but it's a, it's a Middle Eastern thing that says, first we come for the Saturday people, then we come for the Sunday people, to your right. point, right? Yeah. So it, it may start with the Jews. That might be the proverbial, you know, canaries in the coal mine. But, you know, hatred is not restricted to only one group. So once we finish with group A, we move on to group B. But that's what, in a sense, makes me a bit more pessimistic in that, I don't think we learn from history. I don't. Yeah, I mean, yes, most people are lovely. The, most people are kind. Most pe most people are peaceful. But it is part of the the architecture of the human mind, regrettably, to be coalitional, to view the world as us versus them, blue team versus red team. And so, you know, I, I a few months ago, I, I don't think you you and I knew of each other yet. Uh, I had posted a tweet, shy that had gotten a lot of attention, but for a very interesting reason. I think it had gotten, I don't know, 11, 12 million views because it was a very dark and solemn tweet that I had put out. And now that had surprised people because most people knew me as someone who was always happy and joking. And uh, sometimes my jokes get me into trouble, like making the joke about being a Mossad agent. Uh, and that people were saying, oh, well, if Gad Saad is exhibiting, you know, he's putting up his hands in defeat and that there's no way out of this, Maybe we should be paying attention. So I understand the reflex that, hey, I have no other option but to be optimistic. And I get that. That's why I get up every day and I do this show because there's always hope. There's always a tomorrow. But I can't help but feel that it's only going to get worse. Get me out of my pessimistic bent, Professor Davidai. <laughs> I can't. I don't, I wish I could. <laughs> so let me tell you something about my my Israeli summer, last summer, yeah. summer of 2023. Um, so, you know, in the, in the months leading to the summer, uh, my wife and I were kind of involved in the uh, pro-democracy protests happening in New York City about what's happening, the judicial, the planned judicial reform in Israel. And when we went to Israel, we started going to the protests there. And there was one thing that a woman was said in a protest while she was speaking um, that stuck in my mind. And she said, uh, despair is not an effective policy. Or I guess the, the better translation is despair is not an effective plan of action. Because up until that point, I felt like I'm going to protest, nothing's going to happen, you know, they're going to do the ruler class are going to do whatever they want period but when she said that i realized like yeah even if i feel that even if i wake up despair go to sleep despair i have to go and act as if i am not despair um and i think it's the same here um regardless it's independent of how pessimistic i am about what's happening in the israeli palestinian context what's happening with anti-semitism in the us what's happening with um, the, the silencing campaign against me at, in my professional society and at Columbia, independent of all that, despair is not an effective plan of action. I, I have to keep going as if I believe that this will have an effect. Hopefully, well, hopefully it will. But if not, then I know that I'll tell my kids, you know what, the, that year, 2023, 2024, I spoke up. Yeah, beautiful. Well, actually, in 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 the last chapter of the parasitic mind, I use the the call to action: activate your inner honey badger. And the reason why I use that, Shai, I'm I'm sure you you can understand it, is because the honey badger is not arguably is has been ranked actually by animal behaviorists and zoologists as the the most fierce animal alive. It's the size of a small dog, and yet it could withstand the attack of six adult lions. How does it do that? It's fierce. It's ferocious. Now, of course, when I tell people activate your inner honey badger, it doesn't mean it's not a call to violence, but it's a call of defending things that you believe in. So when you stood up there, knowing that you're going to probably get a lot of blowback as an assistant professor who's not yet tenured 
and said, hey, I'm going to speak my mind because it's the right thing to do. You were exactly heeding the call of activating your honey badger. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for that. I love, I love that. I'll tell you what, like I, I, I would take that. I felt more like a cornered rat. <laughs> but like I just felt like they cornered me. They put me try in, not like to they... use rat as an imagery for the Jew because you're only going to be uh, I'm, adding I'm playing into <laughs> I'm playing into her own story, right? But like I really and to be honest, I am I did not anticipate yeah. all of this. I did not like if I had, I don't I I want to believe it, I would have still spoken up. I don't know. And that's the thing. The whole point of like people attacking me personally, right? So here's here's what I've noticed on social media, especially on Twitter and, you know, on social media. What, the stronger the argument that I make, including videos of other people, like highlighting other people's support for Hamas, um, linking these, you know, specific organizations to people that are known to have been involved with Hamas, right? The stronger I make the argument, the more vitriolic the hatred towards me, right? Because, and, and we know this from basic social psychological. It's, I was going to say, it's like a basic effect. When you cannot argue with the with the logic, you argue with the pers the speaker, right? So that's what I've been experiencing. So I actually see it as like, yeah, the more they hate me, the more it means that they cannot argue with the claims. If they could easily break down the claims, then they wouldn't have to, to hate me. But what worries me is they are not doing this because they care about me. Nobody cares about Shai Davidai. Like, you know, I mean, my mom does, my parents, but like, like these people don't really care about me. They care about the fact that an unapologetic Jew is speaking up. Yeah. And by silencing me, or at least showing the cost of speaking up, they're able to silence other people. That is my concern, that there are thousands and thousands of, of Jewish and non-Jewish professors who want to speak up, but they see what happens to me, and they're like, that's not that's not a cost that's worth their time. Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's exactly the strategy, terrorize someone who's high profile so that all of the ones who are thinking of coming into the battle will stay away from it. Uh, but but the irony, I'd say the irony, sorry, I forgot you off. Sure. The irony is I was not high profile. They made me high profile. Like, <laughs> you know, the my, the my my social media posts that go the most viral and end up being in the newspaper is because these haters, the, the anti-Semites are the ones amplifying them. Right. Right. They they are building me up to this symbol so they can pull me down. It was like, and I can only say like, look, I don't like the hate, but thank you for giving me the platform. You're <laughs> helping me reach more people. Indeed, uh, you know, I uh, before we did our, our, our started our conversation, I just wanted to get a sense. That's how I found out that you were from Cornell and so on. I went to check your CV, and uh, you are way more uh, productive than president or former president Claudine Gay, and you're only an assistant professor. I think maybe in 2022 alone. You had published more stuff than her, and uh, I dare say that it's probably none of it is plagiarized. Can you so... imagine how productive I'd be if I actually plagiarized as well? Um, <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I'm thinking, uh, you know, maybe uh, someone should be looking at your CV to look what a productive scholar looks like. Are you at all concerned, given the objective metrics of your CV, about any potential future, you know, tenure uh, decision, or do you feel that? Uh, it will it will work out fine, notwithstanding your public engagements. If you ask me on October six, you'd get a different answer from now. So, like on objective metrics, um, I'm doing fine, and I shouldn't be concerned, right? Like I have I am publishing. I'm doing what I see as good work, and publishing in good places. I get really good teaching evaluations. I love teaching. Um, you know, I've been in different. Uh, awards for teaching, like I just enjoy teaching. I see it as a mission. Um, but we also know how academia works. Academia works in a subjective matter. You bring in 20 people, you know, colleagues into a room, they look at the objective number and then they make objective performance and they make subjective judgments. And then they elicit subjective judgments from other people in the field 
in order to make a seemingly objective argument. Now, I'm not the first or the last person to note the, the problematic nature of the way things are being, you know, the decisions are being held in academia. I will not be surprised if my activism costs me my job. Do I want it to cost me my job? No, I love Colombia. That's the whole reason I'm fighting is because I think Colombia and universities can and should do better. And I want to be in an institution that does better. That's the only reason I'm fighting. If I thought that I can't make it better, if I thought that, or if I hated it here, I would leave. But I think this is, you know, it's a great institution on paper. And I just want to make it great on in practice as well. Um, but yeah, right now my job is in danger. I mean, there's stuff that I cannot share yet, but um, I would just say that, you know, there are certain entities within the university who would be very, very happy to see me silenced and go away and are using whatever processes they have, to weaponizing whatever process to shut me down. Now, some people, when, you know, when I speak about that, some people will say, look, you know, he's, you know, look how he's crying, you know, it's about, the, he's dealing with the consequences. Like, yeah, if this is the consequence of me speaking up, I'll bear the consequences, but I'll also highlight the consequences. Again, to show people what happens when you speak up against the, you know, the homogenous view on campus. Beautifully said. Is there any way that if people want to directly support you in whichever form that might take, uh, please tell us how they might do so now? I thank you so much. I mean, so first of all, I've been telling everyone, like everyone who sends me private message, I thank them so much because just just knowing that there are people out there already is very helpful. Um, it makes me feel less alone. Uh, I ask people who are who feel safe doing so to speak up, you know, speak up on social media. Um, and again, not because they specifically care about me, but because they care about the consequences of silencing someone like me, just like I would speak up for someone else. Uh, and when there's someone who set up, I, I don't know this person, but I met them through social media and Instagram and set up a website called saveshy.com where they were like, hey, like he said, like, I think it's a he, I assume, because his name is Abba Says, that's his thing, so I assumed it was a he. Um, he says, um, we got your back. And I was like, I don't know this person, but like, it's it shows me what real camaraderie is. And it's and I'll tell you what, it's not buying some, you know, something on Amazon to make you seem like an activist. It's doing these kind of things. Beautiful. Uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Safe Shy, Shy is S-H-A-I, so Safe Shy. Yeah. Dot com. What a pleasure having you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, only good things will happen as a result of this. There are little little bits that you have to go through now, but in the grand scheme of life, later in life, when you look back, you'll have nothing to regret about because you did the Thank courageous you. thing. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, stay on the line so we could say off uh, goodbye offline. Thank you so much, Shai. Real pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Cheers.